Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Salon Marketing Live. I'm Stephanie Mitchell from Sunny Star Marketing and I have a special guest that I cannot wait to interview her today. She's Rhea Schwartz from Flirt Wax Bar. She's coming to us from Florida, is that right? Uh, yeah, Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. So excited that I um, met Rhea actually in one of my business coach groups. Um, so Rhea is the owner of Flirt Wax Bar. I'm so excited to share her story with you today and for her to share her story with us because we're talking about how essentially her business journey and how she started out in the business, in the beauty business, how she ended up opening her first salon location when she was just 23. And now six years later, she's grown it into a million dollar plus business. And the amazing part is that Oftentimes, she is traveling the world and getting up to so many really cool adventures. So today we're talking all about how to grow your business, Rhea's story, and I'm so excited. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm super excited to be here and serve your audience as best as I can. <laughs> yeah, of course. Everyone's so excited to meet you as well. So we have Roadshow watching from Connecticut, and we have Bo as well watching. Thank you for being here, guys. Um, so yeah, Rhea, can you just introduce yourself? Tell us more about you personally and then professionally and a little bit about your business. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And when I was in going through high school, I had like the worst acne ever. <laughs> and I would do, you know, chemical peels and all the things and nothing seemed to help. Mm -hmm. So it just made me super interested in skincare. Um, and I just decided I wanted to be an esthetician when I grow up. So I got my license my senior year of high school. Um, I moved to California to work out there for a bit, which kind of jaded me. Oh my um, gosh was really young I would work at these places and I would see what do I like about it what do I don't like what would I do different if I owned a business mm -hmm. um, so I moved back to home to New Mexico after LA and I um, got a job at a waxing salon and after a few years there I decided um, I wanted to open my own business I thought um, waxing was a really good model a business model because hair always grows back every month so if you can keep a client <laughs> month, whereas facials are a little bit more um, lucrative, and not, not everyone does a facial every month. Right. Um, so I rented a room on Craigslist before I even moved to Tampa, and, you know, it looks one way on Craigslist, but when you actually get there, it could look totally different, and that's what happened to me, but I had already signed the lease before So I moved. What, what did it look like, just kind of like dark and dank, it, kind of? Oh my God, it was like the sketchiest building ever. I'm, I am had this like a dream you know I had this really cute name I thought flirt wax bar so I wanted it to be really girly and mm -hmm. feminine and I moved it when I moved to Tampa with no clients it was this dark weird like shared office building it was not cute at all but I made my room cute and I Good. just focused on you know having excellent service for my clients and getting word out and I also really sold people in the beginning on my story because people buy emotions, they don't buy products and services. So if right. you can get connected to your story and like I would tell people my dreams and how I wanted to grow it and all these things. So people or and so when I asked you like, Hey, could you leave me a five star review? Like that would mean the world to me. They would automatically do it because they were so connected to my story and to oh, who that's I was so nice. So what happened after that? So you ended up, you turned kind of a bad situation and you turned it around and you were like, you know what, going to focus on customer service, going to focus on sharing my story. And even though it's not the best place ever, I'm going to make the best of it. And then what did you do? Right. So um, I wanted to move out of that location. So I, um, I was really lucky. So my first year, also, uh, if anyone's starting out, like kind of brand new, looking to get clients at the time, um, it was when like Living Social and what was the other one? Groupon, Groupon was like popular. But I knew that there was a way to do it properly that, you know, I knew a lot of people would go out of business using them. But for me at the time, I just wanted my name out, you know. And yeah. so what you, you have to limit it to one time per person and so people can't buy it over and over right. again. Those people, if they wrote me a review on Google or Yelp, um, I'd give them a discount on their next wax. So that okay, was how cool. I 
and having Facebook and being really active on social media. Mm -hmm. um, Instagram wasn't super big at the time. Um, but yeah, after so what, year, when was that? That was like 2013, was something. 2013. Yeah. I mean, if Instagram was big, I wasn't on it yet. <laughs> yeah, but it hadn't exploded. It no, was it around, but it hadn't exploded. It wasn't like yeah, the place like I had to it be. First, but not for business. Yeah. Yet. So um, every day I would drive by this um, location that was like a retail location, and it was right down the street from where I was working at. And I would just like visualize myself moving in there. I'm like, that would be the perfect place for my business. It was like the cutest building on a busy street, and I would just visualize it constantly. And I'm a really big believer in the law of attraction and visualization. Even back then, like now I do it to a deeper level, but mm -hmm. even then – I had read The Secret, and I, like, knew about that, you know. So um, a year later, I happened, they happened to have an opening, and I got that. And um, I met this guy when my car broke down one day, <laughs> and he was there, and he helped me fix it. And he happened to remodel uh, houses, and I asked him if he'd help me remodel this new location I was moving into. So it's funny, like, the universe works. Yeah, and really wow, just, that you just randomly ended up having that problem, and then that person was there yeah. to help you. Mm -hmm. So I signed a one-year lease on that location, and then, uh, you know, I built it out, made it beautiful, and when my year was coming to an end, my landlord served me a letter that I couldn't renew my lease. And were you, in that year, sorry to interrupt, were you just by yourself in that first year there? Um, I had just hired my first person in that year. So I had just hired my first girl because I was so busy waxing. So I started training. Um, I hired a client that was looking. A co she was a licensed cosmetologist mm -hmm. looking for a job, and she was the sweetest girl. So I hired her and trained her. And um, I felt so horrible because, you know, a couple months after I hired her, I'm getting kicked out of my business. Oh, my gosh. And you know, I had already, this was my second move in two years. So, like, the last thing I wanted to do was move again. Yeah, of course. That's and especially right. after you invested all of that into remodeling and making it kind of through your vision what you wanted it to be. And it's not easy to move your business. Not only is it costly, it's, like, all the little things, right? Like, your business cards, your menus, your website, yeah. like, all the things. Like, clients that maybe can't drive to another side of town. Um. So this was really one of the hardest times in my life because I think I was like 25 at this point and um, I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I, I felt like I spent the last two years kind of going in circles trying to get my business up and I, it was like the I was coming up on the year I was about to like reap my rewards and then this happened. So I had the choice of either give up and get a normal job mm -hmm. or to keep going and find a bigger location, more than I could actually afford, and um, just, like, really go for it because I didn't want to move again. I was like, the next location, if I keep going, like, I am done. So the other thing is he only gave me two months to do this, <laughs> and if I went over the two months, mm -hmm. he was going to charge me double the rent for oh. a month. He was such a jerk. So if you went over the two months, he was going to charge you double the rent. So um, this was just a really it was the most stressful time of my life. I because I didn't have the money and the place that I did find that I wanted was a thirty thousand dollar build out when I didn't have thirty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Triple the size. So it was triple the rent. <laughs> and um, I didn't know what I was going to do. But at that time, I really got into um, this a podcast and personal growth and that's the only thing that got me through and I started listening to the school of greatness Lewis house yeah ever heard of it? I love and, it I love oh that podcast God. so great because I I knew visualization and I knew the secret but listening to his podcast and understanding that you have to literally write it down in present terms like you have to write down and visualize what you want like it already happened and like feel the energy like it already happened hmm. so hmm. I would write down in my journal, like, every single day, like, I got the most perfect location for Flirt Wax Bar. The landlords paid for my build-out, and I would just write, what like, my whole dreams of my team and how many people I wanted and all the things. And so I did get the location that I wanted. and oh, the that's landlord awesome. paid for $20,000 of the build-out. Wow. And my business, it wasn't easy the first year because my old landlord tried to sue me because I didn't get out in time. Oh, my <laughs> and gosh. I, cause I couldn't pay him double rent. I, I was like, I'd rather pay my new landlord than my old one. Yeah. It was a stressful time, but 
Um, you know, I really have come to believe, like, through these, like, really hard times in our lives are all there to serve us lessons so we can grow to the next level yeah. of ourselves, but also the next level in our business. You know, if we don't go through these hard times in business and get through them, um, we'll never grow our businesses because we have, like, this threshold of control. Like, we have this threshold of how much uh, can we take, you know, and I feel like I've been through so much that now... I just take chances and do all kinds of stuff because I'm like, I've been through the worst. Like, nothing can hurt me. So. Oh, that is such a good attitude. I love it. So do you feel like, I mean, if you have a big challenge coming up or if you're trying something, like, completely new and you're not sure whether it's going to work, do you feel like you don't get scared anymore? Um, I mean, that fear is always there, right? Because it's, it's in our nature to have these fears and our yeah. brain wants to protect us from things. But... Um, learning personal development really teaches you how to understand your fears and understand that these are just stories that our brain tells us to protect us and they literally are made up stories so if you can get over the fact that it's a story you're telling yourself and just focus on where you want to go and like what you want to have happen yeah. you know what is it energy focus goes where energy flows no energy flows where focus goes <laughs> so I really try like to make it like, my identity of who I am to always focus on the good. Like, I really rarely focus on the bad or the potential bad. Like, you mm -hmm. always need to weigh the pros and cons. Um, but I'm definitely more of a, like, optimist. <laughs> oh, that is so good. See, for me, myself, I mean, I, in my business, um, since I've launched a few years back, I, I'm always pushing myself and trying new things and getting out of my comfort zone. And like you said, that fear is always there. And I constantly have to tell that like negative voice to just kind of shut up. And I'm actually not an optimist. I tend to always think, oh, what's the worst that could happen and try to imagine that. And then actually, no, I don't even try to imagine that. That just comes unbidden. I do not want to imagine the worst thing. I just can't help it. Yeah. Um, and then I just kind of do it anyway. So, well, that's good. I yeah. mean, especially when you're an entrepreneur, like you are, like you have, to, you have to just go for it. But if you feed your faith more than you feed your fear, oh my gosh, you'll have so much less stress in your life and in yeah. business. Oh, I know. It's honestly like knowing like the tactics and the, how to do this and what to focus on and step by step is really important, but the mindset and, you know, trying new things, getting over that fear and trying to not just imagine what could go wrong, but what could go right is right. so important in business and probably even more important than like all of that other like strategic stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm a big Tony Robbins, um, fan and follower and I go to a lot of his seminars and his uh, business mastery that he teaches which totally that's when my business really went from like low six figures to mm -hmm. like high six figures and really freed up my time but one of the number one things that he teaches is business is 80% psychology and only 20% skill set so you have to have the right mindset for business or yeah. you don't have to, but if you do, it will take your business so much further. Wow. So, yeah, um, I, would, I would love to ask you about the Tony Robbins stuff, too. Um, I personally love Tony Robbins. Um, so what do you think are some of the big things that, like, if you were to say, like, the big one or two things that you learned in, like, shifting your mindset that you learned from Tony Robbins, what would that be? Yeah, the biggest thing at his events, like when you go to them, is really realizing what are the fears holding me back. It comes back to fear, right? Yeah. So a couple big ones like related to my business for me were when, when I had moved to my now third location and, um, you know, my rent tripled, I was paying off debt, I was getting sued, I had all these horrible things. And even though my business was busy, you know, it's what's coming, what's going out versus coming in, right? And I wasn't, it wasn't matching up. Right. So, but at the same time, we were so busy and I had just hired a second girl and this is when we started getting into microblading and not just waxing because mm -hmm. I needed something that was a higher price ticket versus right. wax to kind of even it out. So we were all three so busy and I didn't have a receptionist at this point because I pay um, on commission my team that do services and I was so scared to hire a receptionist because I was like, that was like another bill. Like that's yeah. like not... 
money and I'll pay you off the money you bring in. That's like a fixed bill every month. So I was so scared. And me and my other two girls that were working for me at the time were just like burnt out because we would, you know, take clients all day, answer phones in between appointments and do everything ourselves and then clean at the end of the day, the whole shop. Wow. So um, after my first Tony event, I realized, oh, and right before I went, I had told the girls I was going to hire a receptionist. So I put, I uh, lined up interviews for receptionists and I canceled all the interviews right before because I got scared. Oh my <laughs> gosh, you changed your mind at the very last minute. <laughs> yeah. So then I went to my first UPW and I realized that it was just a fear and I hired a receptionist and my business, I was like, oh my God, I can never not have a, a, a receptionist again because a big thing is like the whoever's quickest by answering phone or email or booking the appointment is going to get it, right? Yeah. Like, if you're slow at getting back to clients, they're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. Unless, unless they're obsessed with you, which you want people to be obsessed with you, but for new clients coming in, they don't care. You may, Maybe they read good reviews, but guess what? Down the street, there's good reviews, yeah, too. Yeah, so. they have, like, a list of maybe, like, top 10 businesses I might check out, and you might just yeah. be one of the 10. So right now, I mean... I have a ton of ways, and I can talk about it later, but that people can book instantly, that they don't even need a person to book. Mm -hmm. But um, that, and then I was at a point where my microblading artist was booked three months in advance. Wow. And I had another room, and I was going to do facials in the room because I also really like people, and my receptionist I had just hired wanted to do facials, and I was like, okay, well, we can add facials because I like you. And it was a horrible idea. (laughs) And I went to Business Master, and I realized, okay, well, you know, you can't always do something because you like someone. Like, it's really easy, especially as artists in our business, um, you know, as estheticians and cosmetologists and everything. We want to be liked and we want to be your friend. And especially if you, you know, we if we like you and we want you to stay, we want you to, like, be happy. Yeah. But you have to do what's right for your business and not what's right for your team. I'm mm-hmm. all about team being number one, but you also have to make smart business decisions. Yeah. And so I also had this fear that, my one girl doing microblading was the only one that could do it as well as her because she's amazing. She's a, a true artist. I hired an artist, never had worked in the beauty industry, and I got a really good training. And she was incredible. Oh, you mean like she was an actual like design artist, like painting, it's sketching? Awesome. Wow. Not by like career, but that she was amazing. Yeah. At drawing. Oh. So I thought no one could be as good as her. There's, you know, I don't want to get someone and they're like half as good as her. But then after business mastery, I realized, okay, all I have to do is like, I'm the entrepreneur, right? Like all I have to do is replicate what I did with her. So I hired another artist Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I got him really good training. And then my business doubled in revenue in like two months. Wow. And then also another thing is just like the fear of thinking our business can't run without us being in it. That was a big one. Yeah, that's huge. That was a huge fear for me. I couldn't afford it or, you know, clients would leave or whatever it is. And once you get past the fear, you you have so much freedom in it, right? Mm -hmm. But once you get past the fear and, I mean, you have to train a team and it takes work, right? Because you want to train them to be like your mini-me's. Like, you want them to be as good as you and you also have to get rid of the fear that, oh my God, if I train someone to be as good as me, that they're going to leave and go do their own thing. Like that's also a fear. So it all comes back to fears. So once you can get beyond all that and train your mini-me's, it'll free up so much of your time so you can start focusing on the business growth and the little things that need to be done on the business Mm -hmm. versus in it with clients all day. And at the end of the day, after taking clients, you don't want to do anything for your business. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can imagine. So... Um, you touched on so many cool points that I would love to go into there. So especially about like working on your business instead of in it, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, um, Rhea, you've been traveling the world and being able to go to so many of these really cool Tony Robbins events around the world and just kind of like do your thing as well and not just being inside of your business physically. So I'd love to chat about that. But um, before we jump into that, just a question. So we talked about like some of what, you know, how you built your business and maybe what were some of the fears that were holding you back and some of the things that you learned in your personal development. But since you started your business, it's six years now? Six years, yeah. Six years. What are some of your most proud accomplishments of things that you've achieved in your business that 
you know, when you first started out, maybe you would never have dreamed of them or they were just one of those things that you were visualizing and hoping that would come true eventually. Right. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, I mean, it's hard to say individually because I am just really proud of what I've created as a whole. But, and some of the stuff I, I, even six years ago, I I was never visually as vain myself, like being out of the business and being Mm -hmm. able to travel the world while I still am making money in my business. Um, But I think I'm most proud of my team. Like, I have a solid team. Like, they are amazing. Like, I can vouch for every single one of them. They're so incredible. They own their jobs. They're book solid. And they really care about clients. And I really think that, you know, when you want to grow your business, team is number one. Like, mm-hmm. people think clients are number one, but if you don't have a good team, you'll never grow your business. Yeah. So I'm definitely most proud of my team. And then second, I'm really proud of the location I built. Like, it's, like, it's beautiful. Oh, <laughs> so cool. What we can do is we can share some pictures in the comments below for when people rewatch this because, you know, being able to see what it looks like it makes such a – it helps you understand what kind of business it is, too. But I think, and just like, I also think I'm just proud of like who I've become in the process Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like in the beginning I was just an esthetician that wanted to have a business, but it's more kind of like working for yourself. Like, but now I feel like more of a true entrepreneur that I, I look at business so differently. Like my passion has really switched from before my passion was everything beauty, right? Like all the treatments and services. And although I'm passionate about that because it's in my business, I'm so much more passionate about learning business, like learning the skills and tools you need to run a successful business. And I feel like through that growth, I feel like I could go into almost any industry and open a successful business just because the skills and tools you need kind of apply to everything. Yeah. Since you have that base, you could really make any business successful. I totally agree. They're so transferable and especially like you said, like the mindset thing and knowing how to grow a team and knowing how to invest in the business instead of just putting all of your time into working there physically. Those are all skills that you can apply to so many different industries and so many different businesses. So building a team is the thing that you're most proud of. And it sounds like you've done such a good job of investing in your team members. So how did you, I mean, it's something that so many people will struggle with is finding good team members, finding people who are reliable, who are responsible, who stick with them. Um, so how did you do that exactly? What do you think has been your secret in building a good team? Um, so, so far, my best, uh, t- like my best team members have been based on referrals. Um, they've either been clients or people that were referred to us from clients, mm-hmm. um, so we kind of have that trust a little bit just by, you know, people don't refer people to you that if they think they're going to be bad, right? Yeah. On you. Um, but I think a huge part is, one, investing in their training, right? Like, my goal is when I'm training a waxer, like, I want you to be me. Like, I want clients to like you more than they like me when you're waxing. Yeah, um, that is such a good goal to have, too. And I'm also really big on, like, hiring uh, personality over skill set. Hmm. So I hmm. would rather hire someone with a good personality than who is already amazing at what they do because I can teach anyone to be a good waxer. It's not hard. Anything you repeat enough and get good training and you'll become good, especially if you specialize in it's all you're doing all day, every day. Yeah. If you're not good in the beginning, in a few months after doing hundreds, you'll be really good. Um, so, but you can't teach personality. Yeah, you can, true. you can teach it a little bit and if you have someone that has a decent personality, you know, you can tweak it a little bit, but I, I'm definitely more personality than anything because when people come into my business, I want them to feel like they're so welcome and it's like your best friend. Um, and what else? Sorry, let me think. Uh, oh, and then right now what we're doing, so I actually keep people for a long time. I think I've had my longest employee for five out of the six years. Wow. And wow. almost everyone on my team at minimum a year, if not like three or four. Mm-hmm. So everyone's been with me a long time. The hardest one to keep for a long time is receptionist, only because um, people do receptionist job kind of as like a stepping stone to where they want to go. Right. And so we have filtered our hiring process for reception and and any hiring where we're doing now Zoom calls. My manager does Zoom calls and filters out before they do an interview with me. And what we do in the Zoom call is 
we want to see your personality. We are asking you questions about your goals and your dreams and your, your life and how you, you know what's the best thing you've ever done for someone, things like that to mm-hmm. really kind of not talk about business. We just want to find out who you are as yeah. a person. That seems to have really helped us too. Oh, I love that so much. So essentially you decided, was it a conscious effort when you were looking for people essentially that you just decided, okay, we can train them later. They don't need to be like at the top of the game, at the top of the skill level. Was that something that you knew from the start or was that something that kind of you learned the hard way? Um, both. <laughs> like I knew that personality was really important. Um, I did hire, I've only fired ever, I think one person and she was amazing. Came from, you know, doing brows and waxing in Beverly Hills. She was already really good at waxing. I tweaked her a little bit, but her personality, I, I, like, I hate to say this, but it was just not good, super fake, bad energy and Mm -hmm. energy is so important. If someone, one person on your team has bad energy, it will affect everyone. Yeah. It's infectious. Like even when I, she was working for me, even I felt uncomfortable going into my own business because her vibe yeah. was just bad, but then she was book solid. And, and, you know, so how do you fire someone that's book solid? Yeah. Right. You have to get over it. One, find a reason, a legitimate reason to fire them. But then two, you have to get over that fear. Hey, if I fire her and she's book solid, it's not going to kill my business. You know, she didn't make my business. I did. I yeah. just added, you know, if anything, I made her life better. Um, so yeah, energy of people is so important, and we go over that in team meetings too. You know, my team might think I'm a little bit into the woo-woo kind of stuff, but if you see, like, any really successful person, if you listen to them, like, these are, like, multimillionaires and billionaires of the world. All of them are into law of attraction, energy, the universe, visualizing, all these kind of, like, woo-woo things. So, hey, I mean, it works. Yeah, I mean, and you are living proof that it works too. So, and, I mean... Me, myself, I wouldn't call myself like a woo-woo person because I've never, you know, followed any of those kind of things. But at the same time, whenever I hear someone like you, um, business coaches or successful entrepreneurs, etc., like you said, you all have that in common of visualizing what you want, being extremely clear on your goals, having that positive energy, letting it follow you around everywhere. And those are all things that no matter where you are in like spirituality or energy or anything like that, you can't deny that those things help you in business as well. So, um, so I wanted to ask you about, um, in the past few years, how you've made that transition of working in your business to working on your business and kind of taking some steps back so that eventually you're able to get to where you are now, where you're traveling and that kind of thing. Right. So, um, when I, after I went to Tony Robbins business mastery Mm -hmm. and I spent like all my savings to go to, it was like a $10,000 event at the time. That's like, that's a lot of money to spend on a ticket. Is that like a week, week long weekend event? Five days. But I mean, he at like, they're like, 15 hour days. So you get a lot of wow. value in it. Yeah. And there's people in that room that do have like a hundred million dollar businesses. So, but then there's people in the room are just starting. So mm-hmm. he, he really does, uh, add value for everyone. Um, but after that, when I learned that was when I first learned how to be a business owner versus a business operator, right? Operators are stressed <laughs> and their business doesn't run without them being there. Owners are not as stressed and they can travel the world when their business still operates. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where I first learned the whole idea of that. And my first thought was I needed to take myself out of the business right away. And so what I did was I emailed that one girl that I ended up firing later, but I knew she was already really good. So I knew I could tweak her a little bit and I could replace myself right away. So that's what I did. I emailed her while I was at the event and I was like, Hey, I want to offer you a job. You'll make double the money working for me than anyone else. And she took it like over email before I even got back to town. So I was able to replace myself right away in waxing. And then also for those people that don't haven't currently like either they're growing their team or haven't hired any team members, Mm -hmm. the hardest transition is the first one, right? Like she was my second waxer, so it wasn't as hard, but the hardest transition is that first person that Mm -hmm. you're bringing into your business and your clients only want you. So the biggest thing I would say is, you know, those clients trust you and they trust your word. 
the person with the most certainty, or in other words, the most confidence, as long as there's rapport, will always influence the other person. So you have to be absolutely confident when you're telling your clients, hey, I am so busy. And so I'm bringing in another, t- you know, someone, I'm hiring my first person or second or whatever it is. But trust me, they are amazing. And I would not steer you wrong. Yeah. That's what I do with every single client. You know, you have to make them understand that this is your baby, like your business and your clients. It's like your baby. Yeah. And you're not going to just hand them anyone. You're going to hand them, you know, if you're trying to get people to switch over to someone else, you're going to, you know, train them amazing. They're going to be just as amazing as you are. And you have to give them that confidence. But then you also have to train them just to be as amazing as you are. Yeah, right? of course. And it's exactly the same. But that's okay because um, as long, that's like kind of what I said at the beginning. You need to sell people your story. And if your story is your dream is to own a big business, you sell them on that story early. You know, like let them know your dreams and goals so they um, understand a little bit more. Yeah, that's true. So when you were kind of – transitioning over especially with that first person how would you communicate that to your clients did you do it mostly like in person at your maybe your last appointment with them did you do it like through email on social media or how um no I did it all in person like when I would see them and then I would oh I would also put it on um social media as well and I would introduce them and stuff Mm -hmm. but at least with my first first um hire I I, it was all in person because it was only me right yeah so anytime they'd come in, I would, you know, let people know and tell them. Um, so, yeah, when I replaced myself with my second waxer, so I had two waxers and a microblading artist, and then I hired another microblading artist at the same time. Um, as soon as I took myself out, I had a whole list of all these little things that would just make client experience better. Um, little things like, um, you know, I'm, I'm all about beautification, but so anything that would make it more beautiful adds value and you can charge more mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it's just a better experience for the client. But also things like, um, what else? Things like, uh, sorry. Oh, um, like I, we used to have paper consent forms mm-hmm. and then I switched them to, um, electronic consent forms. Okay, cool. <laughs> so that list of things that you had were those things that like, throughout the years you had always kind of had in the back of your mind, but now that you had hired this other person, you're like, okay, now it's time to execute on them? Um, No, I actually hadn't even thought of them, right? Because when we're in our business, like working with clients so much, like I I thought I was like, I always thought, oh, we're the best in Tampa. You know, like we have five stars all over, we're so busy, all these things. Um, But until you really have that space and time to really look at your business as a whole, Mm -hmm. Um, that's when I found all the little things, right? I found, okay, this could be better and this and this. And like, I had like a page and I banged that page out within like two weeks of all these little things that could make it better. And so the first things that you were talking about, those details, were they like design details inside of your salon? Um, ah, sorry. I'm, it was, it was like a few years ago, so it's hard to remember everything. Like I knew the, the electronic consent forms Mm -hmm. was one of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was me. Oh, that's when I learned about booking and like being the first to book them yeah so when I got I you know I use mind body um for our booking system but Mm -hmm. and they do a branded app so I was like okay instead of people going online to book it why don't we just make an app and then it's so much easier and I still do that I think you know constant and never-ending improvement is key so I'm always looking for things even now that you know we're booked all day and successful I'm always looking for the little things so, like, recently, I added an AI system to my um, booking software. Wow. So, any calls that we have will automatically be texted by an AI. And an AI sounds like a real person. So, people are getting texted by a machine, but they think it's a real person because it's it, it learns as it goes by conversation. And Is that, like, sh- text messaging or, like, actual phone calls? Text. Oh, but, text. Um, as soon as I did that, any gaps in our schedule also got booked. So like any all those little things really add up. That is um, so cool. What is that? Um, what's the AI software for texting? Um, I'm using Front Desk AI. Okay, cool. Interesting. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Um. So that and then just also being constant everywhere, right? Like I'm really good at. I at the time I was constant on Facebook and now and then I was like, okay, I need to be more consistent on Instagram too. Mm-hmm. And we don't. You know, at the time, I just had Yelp reviews. We were just, like, number one on Yelp. 
But I also realized, oh, my God, we need to be on Google, too. Like, we need to be everywhere. So then we started focusing on uh, building our Google reviews. Yeah. Wow. So you were essentially, once you hired that person, it was kind of like a snowball effect of now I have, like, all this, you know, freedom and also more time to be able to implement all these sales and marketing tactics that I just was too, you know, I had these blinders on and I didn't have maybe the time or the energy or even like the space to think about. So you started to do that. And then how from there, how were you able to step back even more and eventually just physically not necessarily come in for, let's say a few weeks at a time? Yeah, it was really hard at first. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was so also at this time, I'll tell you this story. Um, at the same time, as I was like, you know, after a business mastery and I hired these people and I took myself out, at the same time I was going through a lot of health stuff where like half of my body was numb and every oh day it was worse. And so at the same time I was trying to figure out what was going on with my health, but I was so on fire from this event mm-hmm. that I like, was banging out all this business stuff. Um, but... You know, I think I still had that idea of, like, even though I was doing all this stuff, I still had to make an appearance at my business every day. So it got to the point where I had to go to the hospital for a few days. And even, like, first thing out of the hospital, because my mindset hadn't totally switched yet, first thing out of the hospital, I went right to work. And I was, like, coming off of steroids, which they can make you like your hormones go crazy and all this stuff and I was just not in the right mindset and I went right to work because my still just like I have to make an appearance at work because I'm the owner you know yeah you were scared that if you didn't go in that things would start to fall apart and I was so emotional and I I remember going in and I just like sat in my my manager's room and I just was like crying and because I was so emotional and anyway that point made me realize like you don't have to go to work every day Hmm. You know, like you're the owner of this business and it works fine without you. And you like, you know, it was just a big, I don't know. It was a big step for me because I really did feel that way. And if I got a, I I, I don't like to show emotion, like not that I don't show emotions, but to be that emotional in front of someone like you as the owner or boss, you need to set the standard of what's okay. And I tell my team, I mean, I support them. And if they have problems in their personal life, they can come to me. But I also tell them, like, that energy can't affect everyone else, you right. know. In the, like, you kind of need to leave it at home. Mm-hmm. So that was a big one for me. And so after that, I started um, slowly, like, not showing up as much. And then and realizing it was okay. Like, my business still runs without me. And it was kind of that fear of, what are they going to think I'm doing at home all day? You know, like things like that. Yeah. But getting that fear, I was like, you know what? I put in all the work. I was the one that got sued. I started at 23. I sacrificed so much. And you have to realize yourself, you know, as the owner that it's okay. Like you worked hard and you deserve it. And I just had to have that realization. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So were you like during that time, then what kind of spurred you to go and take the next steps which is like okay well now I can travel so where did you travel to and how did you like make the decision to be able to do that um so again so I was I took my manager um that summer like a couple months later in the summertime I took her to uh, unleash the power within again Tony and um she attended and I volunteered and it was at that event um and I guess I'll just uh, sorry I'll explain this part too because I think it's a it probably makes it more relevant. So um, with my health scare, what happened is I ended up getting diagnosed with um, multiple sclerosis. Oh, my um, gosh. You've ever heard of that? Yeah. And so it's like where you, you know, your immune system attacks your nerves and your uh, your myelin sheath around your nerves and your brain and spine. So a lot of people can get paralyzed yeah. or all crazy stuff. So that's what I was diagnosed with. Oh, and, my gosh. I had a doctor, a neurologist, look me in the eye, and he was like, if you don't take this drug, like X drug, you'll never walk again. And it's so scary when you hear that, you know, take the drug. And that drug made me feel horrible. I mean, I was 27, and I was sleeping all day. I was so brain fogged. And it was all the symptoms of MS, but I I knew it was from the drug. Hmm. 
So when I took my manager to Unleash the Power Within and I was volunteering at it and I just being around that energy of people and that mindset and the things that Tony teaches have just really changed my life and how you just have to have so much certainty. Like when you know something's right or wrong you, and like no matter what anyone says, you just have to trust your instinct. Hmm. And I knew I was like, I hate taking this drug. Like it's making me feel horrible. Yeah. Like I feel like it may, it's making me feel like death and you know, I already was kind of into natural health at the time, but I was so scared to do it because, you know, a doctor told me otherwise. And I was at that event and I made a decision and I was like, you know what? I have to be around this energy like all the time because that's the only way I'm going to keep my certainty that I can cure this by myself. Even if doctors say there's no cure, I can cure it by myself naturally. And so that's what I did. Hmm. I tried to like 20 events in two years 20 of Tony Robbins events yeah I don't take any drugs at all and I just do like biohacks and natural stuff and I feel great so oh that's so good wow I started traveling so much so I was like all in I was like let me just be around these people this mindset and so being around that also you know I was you become who you hang out with. So I was surrounding myself with entrepreneurs who had a right mindset, who had businesses that were way bigger than mine, and you learn from them and taking those keys. I didn't have to be home all the time to do the little things that make a big difference. Yeah, so it's kind of like the 80-20 rule of like 20% of the things that you do will make like 80% of the impact. Totally. So what are those, like, I mean, when you're going to these events, when you're traveling, What are those kind of like 20% of things that you know make a huge impact on your business back home? Um, Right. So number one, Facebook ads for sure. (laughs) Love me some Facebook ads. Uh, especially for microblading and I don't I you probably know way more about Facebook ads than I do but I do know what works for my business Mm -hmm. and what's worked for my business so far is um as soon as I upped my ad spend like I used to be fearful and I was only spending like 20 or 30 dollars on an ad now I spend around four to five hundred on an ad and this was before my business blew up I started spending like tripling quadrupling my ad spend Mm -hmm. and it blew up my business that's awesome especially for like microblading when it's a seven hundred dollar appointment yeah and have a non-refundable deposit so I can track it really easily like when I run an ad and I I track it by how many deposits do we book Mm -hmm. Um, from that ad but I also I always try to hit like 20 to 30 thousand people that see it for an ad because it used to be really easy. It used to be people only needed to see, you, like, your business, like, advertise, like, four times to go in in it. Now it's 16 impressions. So and 16 of- times that they need to see one of your ads in order to be like, yep, this is for me. I'm going to put a deposit in. It used to be four, but now we're so bombarded with so many ads all the time. And another big thing was value marketing. Um, we started making videos of more educational or just who we were as a salon. Mm-hmm. And I started those and that was helpful too because people want to see people don't want to see robots right and they don't want to see like um like everything's perfect they want to see real people so I made a video of um you know who we are and what we stand for and we started giving back more and doing like uh pay with a smile for breast cancer awareness month and filming those so we would do stuff like that and that was really helpful Oh, that is so cool. So you found, have you kind of combined those videos with Facebook ads? And um, I always promote those videos. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. So have you found that since you've put money into videos, do you feel like they tend to convert better to get appointments? Um, the videos aren't necessarily to convert to appointments. Mm-hmm. Um, they're more for just people knowing who we are. Branding. Um, my conversion ones come from uh, if I post like a before and after picture, I'll mm-hmm. just boost the post, and that's when I start tracking, you know. And I'm like, okay, we went from booking ten microblades in a week to booking twenty, you know. And that's I I don't have the math right now, but it, it's a lot, you know, of pre-booked seven hundred dollar appointments that wow. so I know they're coming. Yeah. So Facebook ads work, everyone. If anyone ever doubted whether they worked or not. <laughs> <laughs> Here's living yeah. proof here. Um, okay, so Facebook ads and video marketing is one of the things that you do that like 20% that makes a huge impact. Is there anything else that you focus on? 
yeah, reviews are huge. Um, so for example, I have one of my, um, team members has like 20,000 followers and one has 10 and they do the same thing. They both do microblading, but the one, they're both amazing, but the one with 10 followers, 10,000 versus 20 books up a little further in advance only because she has more reviews online. Hmm. Reviews are so important. And so I, and I, I teach my team that too. I teach them how to ask for reviews. We give, you know, $10 off for reviews. And um, this month we're doing like a game, like whoever gets the most reviews this month, I'll give like a $100 gift card to their favorite store. Oh, that's so, cool. So are they getting reviews like for their personal account or are they getting reviews for Flirt Wax Bar? Well, it, no, it's for Flirt Wax Bar, but, you know, they'll say their name in the review. Okay, got it. Um, no, yeah, you always want to get it for your business. <laughs> Um, but that and then Instagram has been huge. And now when I run ads on Instagram, um, I don't get it necessarily to book because that conversion for some reason, and maybe you know better, but for some reason my Instagram ads don't convert as well, but I get a lot of more yeah. followers. Yeah, so that's I, the thing. I feel like Instagram is really, really good for branding, but in terms of actually getting people to book, especially if they want to like message your page or something like that to get more information about a service. Yeah. I found that Facebook ads work so much better. So it's good because you need like that to be in front of people all the time. Mm -hmm. I think it's to have both run some ads yeah. that you actually want to book appointments and run some ads just to gain followers and let people know who you are. Yeah. Definitely so, agree. And then, yeah. yeah. And, and then I always tell my team like my goal and their goal should be this too, because the busier they are, the more money they make, you know? Um, is to be like, I want to be the number one in Tampa. Like I want to, it to be crazy to go anywhere else. Like once you walk into my salon, you would literally be insane to go somewhere else. Like that's how I want to make it. So I want that way in reviews, in the decor, in the friendliness, like that's like our goal with everything make it crazy to go anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And it's so nice to have such a clear vision of exactly what you want so that, like you said, you can also kind of instill that in your team members so that every single thing that they do is working towards that. Yeah. So where do you see your business going like in the next five years? So in the next five years, oh gosh. Um, I hope to still have a really solid, busy business. And, you know, I've thought about multiple locations, mm -hmm. but I think I'm at a point in my life um, that I'm more, I'm more passionate about what's going to light me up. Because I also, last year I started an, another business that was um, online and not the one that we had talked about, but another one, and that makes money, and so it's not about the money as much for me anymore mm -hmm. as it is, what am I passionate about? Yeah. So opening another location would be really easy, and it would make money, and I think it'd be successful, but what lights me up is I'm so creative, like I wanna do something new. Um, so I actually um, am in the work of opening a biohacking center in Tampa, like wow. the first, because it's what's helped me so much. So I become really passionate about health and uh, different options of health. So that's kind of been like my new passion. And uh, hopefully in the next five years, I'll have two businesses or more, but different spaces basically. Oh my gosh. So I know you're just like, you said you're kind of planning it and it's something that you'd like to do, but what exactly is a biohacking center? What does it consist of? Yeah. So it's basically, I'm going to have a, have you heard of cryotherapy before? Mm -hmm. So that's like considered a biohack, right? It's like you do it for three minutes and it's good for your skin, for your cells, for all kinds of different things. So Biohacking was um, made popular by Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof Coffee mm -hmm. Guy. And so basically, there's all these different machines. And a lot of these machines I actually learned about at events because Tony's really into health. So he'd mm -hmm. have these vendors and these machines are amazing. I would do them. I'm like, oh, my God, like my energy feels different or this feels different. And so I actually have turned my apartment into like a biohacking apartment. So I <laughs> machines like every day and they've helped me so much wow. so I have a ton of different machines that basically like hack your biology right like they make they take what you have and <clears throat> excuse me optimize it optimize cellular health kind of like from the inside out like mm -hmm. change your energy they can change brain waves really cool stuff um so there's nowhere in tampa yet that has 
everything all in one with an unlimited monthly membership and like vitamin IVs and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so that's kind of my next project that I'm super passionate about. Um, yeah, because that's really it's like, interesting. It's freedom. Like you, you don't want to just like sit home and do nothing, you know, like that's probably why I was traveling so much is because why not? But now that I'm home more, I'm like, okay, I really need a project to work on. Mm -hmm. And something that you said that lights you up, that makes you super excited and not yeah. like, because I mean, opening a second location, like you said, it would be easy ish in the sense that you know now exactly how to market it and how to build your team and that kind of thing. But oftentimes it's just kind of like the next challenge. It's like, what is something that can challenge me? Yeah, definitely. So cool. Wow, Rhea. So just one more question for you. I kind of am starting to get into a trend of asking people this at the end of the interview. Where do you see the beauty industry going in the next few years? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I haven't, okay. I haven't really thought about it too much, but um, I think Personally, like green beauty is going to become more popular mm -hmm. because as people learn about like all the toxins in hair products and skincare and that kind of stuff, I do think as people learn more, they will go more towards those products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but then I also think preventative measures like lasers and that kind of things, they already are popular, but I think those will be more readily available and cheaper than they are right now because... Yeah to become like the new Botox, right? It's like you don't get Botox, you get laser before you need Botox, and that's what you do. Oh, so cool. Wow. Thank you for those insights. And I definitely agree, especially on like the clean beauty fronts and caring for the environment as well, because it's becoming like quickly the number one thing that's on so many people's minds. And clean beauty for your body oftentimes means clean beauty for the environment as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Well, Rhea, thank you so much. Um, your story has been so inspiring for me to talk about mindset and growth and some of the challenges that you faced and kind of like how you've overcome them and just turned all of that passion that you have into a business that pretty much runs without you. And you know, what are the levers that you have to press to make it go? And it's just, it's been so eye opening. Aw, thanks. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really love it, and hopefully I added some value for um, your girls. Yeah, everybody has been loving watching this interview, I'm sure. So if anyone wants to get in touch with Rhea or to um, follow Flirt Wax Bar, I have tagged Flirt Wax Bar on this Facebook video, so you can just check it out in the comments, see what she's up to, and um, see some of the pictures of your awesome, beautiful space <laughs> and some of your beautiful microblading work as well. So. Oh, Thank you so much um, again, Rhea, and for everyone watching, I will see you again next week on Salon Marketing Live. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Bye.